The 90s was about text on the internet. The 2000s was about images. The 2010s was about video. And we feel pretty strongly that the 2020s is gonna be about interactive 3D and gaming technology being used uh, in the enterprise. Games are essentially virtual simulations. Mm -hmm. And those virtual simulations, you know, have been designed for fun uh, over the last couple couple decades. But increasingly, we're going to be seeing them used in the real world for all kinds of use cases, whether it's, you know, training and, you know, learning and development or training grounds for robotics and other autonomous systems or visualization uh, for, you know, to allow folks to see uh, things come to life in real time 3D. maybe and also are there any that you think maybe are overlooked you know everyone references gpus today as maybe one example but are there others people forget that nvidia was a gaming company yeah. um almost all of the the revenue in the early years was for great gaming graphics cards processing units for computationally intense and matrix multiplications which were great for rendering images and animations and videos but then we soon found that it was useful for things like cryptocurrency mining and of course now AI feels workflows. like everything digital biology like the the idea of this accelerated computing is now being used just right. about everywhere totally and i was looking back at uh some of nvidia's earliest websites and the headline was the future is 3d mm. and it's so funny that 25 years later while it's been slower than one would have hoped for this real-time 3d to intersect yeah uh with all these other industries and we'll talk a little bit about why you know, we think now is the right time. But, you know, if we go back, you know, the 90s was about text on the internet. Yeah. Uh, you know, the 2000s was about images. The 2010s was about video. And, and we feel pretty strongly that the 2020s is going to be about interactive 3D and gaming technology being used uh, in the enterprise. And maybe just to take a step back, why is it that games or the gaming industry and the technologies that are derived from that why is that a crucible for innovation? I mean, Jensen said in himself that he allowed consumer spend to fund the R&D mm -hmm. to bring it to what it is today. And I think that that's an interesting lens to think about gaming technology. In the gaming industry, technology innovations are celebrated. It's, you know, new technology, whether it's new platforms or new features or, or uh evolutions that allow new game designs yep. to emerge and flourish the gaming community both players and developers it's a it's a hacker mentality and totally and and so it's it's no surprise that that's where you know big breakthroughs uh have emerged in the past and where we're going to see them continue to emerge yeah and some of those breakthroughs aren't always obvious as breakthroughs a good example is multiplayer right multiplayer has existed forever right. in gaming and then it took a while for that to really penetrate or really companies were built off the idea of multiplayer. You take something like Figma, right? Exactly. So on that note, today in the gaming industry, there's still lots of innovation happening that maybe again in a decade or so we'll see elsewhere. And so let's talk about those tailwinds. You talk about three in your big idea. Yeah. And, and you know, before A16Z, I was at Unity for close to five years and got a front row seat to seeing how all these various industries were beginning to experiment with real-time 3D um, for some of the things that I talked about before, whether it's like visualization for mm -hmm. architects to be able to walk through their design before it's constructed and they so can cool. see if there's you know errors or other sort of imperfections that they wish they had known when they were designing. Or for automotive manufacturers, they use real-time 3D for also the design, but also virtual test driving. And wow. now the sort of, you know, heads up displays that you see and, you know, Rivian is powered by Unreal, BMWs is powered by Unity. There's the virtual training, whether it's for heavy machinery operations or other sort of operations tasks. But some of the bottlenecks for a lot of these use cases that mm -hmm. seem so obvious are really some of the same constraints that the gaming, you know, that game developers have faced. And so it's, you know, bottlenecks on the content creation side. Mm -hmm. Within a game studio, you know, more than half of the spend goes towards creation of the the assets and the art right. and the content that goes into these uh, virtual simulations. And the same is true on for these non-gaming use cases, except they don't have 3D artists on staff to build those. Right. Um, and so now when we have... Uh, 
AI for for asset generation, whether it's images or audio or now 3D assets, yep. it makes that so much easier. So that's one. The second is uh, for 3D capture techniques. So for a lot of these not gaming use cases, they want to capture the physical world as it's mm. built and as it's seen. Like there is a correct version. Yes. In a way. Yes. And there's been technologies in the past that have allowed this, things like photogrammetry or in the case of Matterport, for instance, where it's basically just a 360 degree image, but you can't actually mm. interact with the environment the same way you can with a video right. game. Well, now with uh, newer technologies, neuro for neural radiance fields of a couple years ago, and more recently, other radiance fields technologies like Gaussian splatting, which allow you know consumers to capture in a much more efficient manner and it's you know photorealistic lifelike and it's and, immediate right yes. in terms of the capture exactly and then the third is for some of these non-gaming use cases uh this is where we're going to see the prevalence of uh of xr and being able to put on a headset and see how you know the bim model overlays on the construction site mm. or you know for medical you know surgery simulation or other other use cases like this um and as we have you know better better headsets lighter you know with eye tracking and, and other amazing technologies you know there's still lots to come in terms of development there but i think that's going to unlock some of these absolutely cases. and as we talk about all three of those tailwinds so again the content creation the capture that you mentioned and then the devices it feels like each one of those has their own cost curve and we're all we're traversing down that cost curve pretty quickly across all three. Can you speak to the economics there? I mean, you touched on it a little bit in terms of even games. You said fifty percent uh, goes toward content creation. Yeah. Um. So how quickly is that dropping? And then same thing for the devices. Particularly for these non-gaming use cases, you know, some of which photo photorealism is everything, and that's why you know as. Unreal and other 3D engines have progressed towards, towards photorealistic. These use cases have been unlocked. Mm -hmm. But for other use cases, actually, you don't really care, you know, if the what the BIM model looks like, so long as it has utility for you. Um, and so, as some of these asset classes are up to par with what they would expect to use for these, the cost drop dramatically. But more importantly, I think like particularly if you think about virtual training use cases where let's say we wanted to train our, our workforce on maintenance and repairs for a robot. Well, you would build this uh, experience and you, you would fund the, the development of this virtual simulation. But then after the fact, uh, if, if the team wanted to update it mm -hmm. or add content to it, they'd have to go back to the outsourced you know, agency who, who, who built them the original right. digital twin. Yeah. And now they'll be empowered to do that themselves internally. So what you're pointing at is it's not just a one-to-one, -one, how is the economics of creating one thing? How is that changing, but also how it's integrated totally. into the entire system? That's really interesting. Let's talk about applications. You've sure. already touched on a bunch, but you've mentioned several companies which are very different, right? Yes. Android, Tesla, BMW, and then you've also talked about workforce training. Like, tell me a little bit more about those applications, and you know, where does it end, or is it really we're seeing it everywhere? Autonomy is deeply rooted with these virtual simulations. Yeah, Android as uh, as a great example. Uh, funny enough. Anderil's first acquisition was a game studio, really, which would be surprising for uh, a defense tech company. I guess if you take Palmer's past. Yeah, they were interested in acquiring it for the game engine that this studio had developed, and they used that technology for strategy simulation mm. and other autonomy workflows. And then with other companies, Applied Intuition as an example, it's just impractical with the, the scale of training data that you need to capture this in the real world. Mm. And so when you have these virtual simulations, you can not only scale the, the amount of data, but also the, the fringe and edge cases that, are, that you would never be able to experience yeah. uh, or, or capture in the real world, whether it's like extreme weather or you know human intervention that is one one in a thousand situations but of course you know for these things to be deployed they need to take into account all these edge cases one way to put what you just said around applied intuition is that you can actually do something new that you couldn't do before with the ability to simulate at scale are there other downstream opportunities or like second third order effects that you can think of 
that we get from these virtual environments. While in the past, you know, we had the ability to use these virtual simulations for, uh, for physics training environments or, you know, like the learning and workforce development that we talked about, but these were mostly either, you know, physics simulations or hard skills. Yeah. Um, but now with, you know, we call them AI NPCs in the gaming context, mm -hmm. whereas before NPCs were scripted and, uh, but now these agents can take on, you know, a life of their own. They can observe the environment, uh, they can reason and plan, and then they can act. Yeah. Well, when you have a multi-agent simulation, when we think about the next pandemic response or, you know, immigration policies and how those imp impact a civilization, uh, we're going to we're going to be testing these in a virtual environment with these agents who can interact with each other. A lot of the applications you've mentioned have been more enterprise focused, right? A company like Android mm -hmm. or Tesla. Gaming obviously existed to begin with in the consumer sphere. And so do you see more consumer applications already yes. also coming up? So one of the ones that I've just been so excited for and I'm and, and looking out for is, you know, I just moved into a new apartment. And as I as I wanted to plan out the space, yeah, I was still using grid paper and pen. Same. <laughs> um, despite the fact that we've had the Sims for you know, 25 years uh, yeah. where we can in a 3D environment, drag and drop furniture and see how it fits. And all the technology exists today to have that experience uh, in an amazing intuitive way. And yet it doesn't exist, but we should be able to, and we can scan our space mm -hmm. and develop a, a digital twin of the 3D environment. We should be able to show it, you know, design inspiration that I find from Pinterest, have it find the, the, the pieces of furniture or the artwork uh, that closest matches my inspiration, totally. fill the scene, and then either be able to walk through it in a virtual world or use augmented reality and see how it fits into your space with your dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like a 3D Wayfair, if you will, where there's totally. the end consumer has uh, a lifelike digital twin visualization of their space. All right. So looking to 2025, so far we've talked mostly about technologies that have been invented over the last few decades. But there's obviously this wave of new technologies that are really exciting, haven't really found their footing necessarily in terms of applications. Is there anything you're paying attention to there and maybe how that intersects with gaming? Yeah, there's some really interesting research and work being done in the HMI human machine interaction space. Oh. You know, you can imagine all kinds of different use cases, but as with most emerging tech, there's probably going to be, you know, initial use cases in gaming that sort of um, are the are the wedge for for these companies to uh, use consumer spend to fund their R and D, similar to Nvidia. So obviously, Apple Vision Pro made huge progress this year with eye tracking, but we are going to see BCI type technology that reads energy signals from your brain to actually control and interact with uh, with the computer in the virtual environment. Um, so we can you know we can think about VR use cases where mm. I can use. Um, you know, strictly my brainwaves to interact with 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 the scene, uh, which is amazing. And then the inverse is true too. And we've seen technologies that allow sort of sensory or digital touch based on you know solely wearing a ring on your finger, right? Um, for you know increased immersion in the virtual world, um, which is sort of like the dream of every gamer <laughs> to be able to be fully immersed uh, with that haptic feedback. Um, you know, not just in the game controller, but actually, you know, throughout your body. 